Hi everyone, uh, before we start, um, I am Simon De La Riviere. I uh, am a developer at Consensus. Um, I've also been uh, writing a book about blockchain technology for the, for the past month. Um, sorry, not past month, more than a year. Um, and I'm still busy with that. And um, tokens are one of the things I'm focusing on, which I think is very important, because the timing is right for this. So I'm going to talk about tokens, token standards, and then um, what you can use tokens for. Um, uh, I had an accident with my laptop last night. We had some wine, so I spilled over it. So I don't have my laptop with me anymore. But uh, then I decided also thought that the Wi-Fi would be fine, but it's not. <laughs> so the, the slides might be a bit behind and a bit slow. Um, so why are tokens important at this point in time? It's because um, soon, and it, it has already started, um, is that when you see the next picture, you will see that this is what's pretty much going to happen soon and is happening. Um, no, there aren't tokens under your seats. That would have been great. But everyone's going to get a token. People are going to mint tokens for everything. So what are tokens? Why do we care about it? There are several reasons why we want to use tokens. And tokens are, there are several ways to describe it. Um, you can describe tokens as assets, uh, digital assets, and so forth. I like Personally, I like to use the words fungibles. That's not a fungible, that's a fun gerbil. Um, <laughs> um, but if you want to know what a fungible is, it's a something that's of the nature of kind to be freely exchangeable, replaceable in whole, in part for any like nature of kind. And fungibility is a property of a good it's a commodity whose individual units are capable of mutual substitution. So, that's just basically fancy speak for saying you can trade things around and you can measure the amount of units you have for something. So um, when you think of tokens, uh, people often think that it's sort of worthless play money, but we use tokens in almost every facet of our lives. We use tokens as coins, currencies. We think about it as shares or equity in things. Um, it can be prediction market outcomes. It can be used in energy meters to represent energy, hours, tickets, access tokens. Etc. Etc. So it can it can represent almost anything, and the reason why this talk is important at this point in time because this is the first thing that um, a lot of people are going to use on Ethereum and have already started using it in Ethereum is that we need to find a way for things for these kind of token systems to interoperate with each other, and then also find a way for um, other DApps to use these tokens in their ecosystems. So. There's been a community effort, mainly um, spearheaded by the foundation, to design some of these standards um, so that uh, these things can interoperate easily. And the current ones are around tokens, registries, data feeds, and forwarding contracts. Um, the most important one at this stage is tokens, because that's the first one most people will use. The standards are important. Um, Usually standards are important, but the reason why it's uh, relatively more important in Ethereum's case is that when you deploy things, uh, you can't re it's more difficult to update it unless you build in these kind of features to allow to change functionality in the future. So if we assume we're going to have a token, for, which is a share in a company that's going to last 150 years, um, then this thing needs to be uh, future-proof as possible. So that's why these standards are important and why we need to um, uh, discuss this. So one of the other problems with standards is the standards are not easy. Um, this is a relevant SKCD comic. The, there would be a situation where there are 14 competing standards. And then someone says, that's, that's ridiculous. Why don't we just make one universal standard that takes all use cases into account? And what you end up with is just 15 competing standards. <laughs> um, standards often um, develop like uh, JavaScript in a sense that all that you need to do is to be in the right place at the right time. The thing that gets the most adopted is the standard that wins. JavaScript was built to be used in the browser, and before we knew it, it's used on hardware. So it's literally just being in the right place at the right time, which standard's being used the most often. You can discuss ad infinitum about what kind of things should be in a standard, but the one that will win at the end of the day, it will be used by most people, is the one that gets developed the, uh, the most or deployed. So with the Mist and Ethereum wallet um, recently launched, you can issue and create tokens from there. And Everyone already needs to consider that, that a lot of people have really started issuing tokens. So what do the current token standards um, look like? Uh, they only deal with transfers 
and approvals. So a transfer is how do you send tokens around. And the approval system is the possibility to, to give custodian access to other people, uh, other contracts and, and so forth. It does not pres prescribe anything about how these tokens are created. That's up to the token creator to decide. And the general idea behind token systems is that a token system lives in a specific contract. Uh, sorry, at a specific address. So these, these standards look as follows. Um, this was taken from the wiki page, so everyone can, can go look at it. So the first one is just a basic transfer. You, send, you, you are authorized to send your own money to someone else. Then you have the transfer from, which is once you've given someone else the possibility to send money on your behalf, you specify who needs to send to whom. Then a normal balance of um, 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 API, which is, as it's obvious, it returns the amount of tokens at a certain address. Then these are the uh, approval APIs, which is the first one is uh, the possibility to give full custodian um, uh, over your account. So it's essentially saying this contract can do whatever they want with my money. You need to trust that contract is not going to do something stupid or crazy. Um, then you can remove or revoke that access. And this, the unapprove, uh, revokes both once off, um, once off control and full custodian control. The once off control is where you essentially, it's like a deposit type system where you essentially give a contract uh, the ability to once off up to a certain amount withdraw money or extend money from your account. And then you have helper functions which you use to basically check if, there, if the account has um, access to do certain things. So based on that, we created a um, basic standard token. Uh, the, the funds are created in the constructor, so it's essentially saying whoever mints the, the contract is the owner of the initial balance. Um, I'm going to post these things on um, the subreddit and um, online so you can go find the, some of these examples we've created. Uh, that's what it would look like. Um, then uh, we thought about the problem of, well, a lot of these functionalities will be duplicated uh, substantially. Um, so one of the things we considered was rewriting a lot of the core functionality into a library. So for those that don't know, this is really awesome. Libraries, um, like uh, uh, Christian explained earlier, is you create the capability for code to live at a certain place on the blockchain, and then uh, you essentially call those functionality and execute it in the current environment or the calling code of the specific contract. So you would, for example, have a token system that then uses transfer functionality, but you don't have to deploy the transfer functionality for each token system each time. So we wrote a library um, to do this. Um, it will also be available. Um, and then the, imp the actual implementation, which is the stuff you deploy, is much smaller. So this is just what it, the actual token, each time you mint a new token contract, what it would actually look like. So we did some tests to see if it's substantially cheaper. And this was the estimated gas cost for the normal one. And the library is, uh, is a bit cheaper, I'm sure. Uh, there's still some gas optimization tricks we could employ to make it even more cheaper. Um, we'll see what happens. Most of the stuff, most of the stuff came into uh, when we started thinking about gas optimization was um, the fact that um, was the fact that Gnosis and other prediction markets they they essentially mint tokens for each event and and specific outcome. So you would have the prudential race, then you would need the token system for uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, Jeb Bush, and whatever. You would have spe mint a specific token contract for all of them. And if we assume, like we hope will happen, there will be millions of prediction markets and millions of outcomes, and we're predicting the future very wonderfully, then it comes very um, expensive to mint these tokens each time. So we thought about the possibility of adding an, ad an identifier an optional identifier to a token system, but it meant it adds some kind of complexity to the standards that most tokens might not use. So this is an example of things where it gets, it can get quite complicated in terms of what this, the community ends up using. Um, there are ways in which you can have exactly this type of um, system, and then it, you use essentially a constellation of forwarding contracts around this kind of thing, but it's out of scope of this talk. Um, what we're going to do from year on out um, is we've built the basic Nick dots and made this really nice 
simplistic interface. Um, that basically means anyone can create a token contract and because we conform to the wonderful standards, it means you can just use that address in the current Ethereum wallet and you can trade and exchange your Simon tokens for, no, I'm not selling beers, but you can exchange <laughs> it for something else. Um, then eventually we're going to make more, uh, more complicated token issuance and management system that will involve the options to pick and choose certain features. So if you want an administrator or you want the possibility to mint tokens into the future, if tokens should, de should decay, you know, there are lots of var variables involved and then to make it easy to plug and play these kind of things. Um, yeah, that's an example of the identifier code. Given these things, um, there are still some thoughts that we have around uh, the token standards. And that's why I thought this is a perfect time because we have all the developers in the room to consider these things. One of the most pertinent ones that we want to introduce that uh, is the a get total or total amount API that's not currently in the token standards. Um, this is it, what it should return is just based on whatever the token deems to be the case, the amount of tokens in circulation. And this is important for scenarios where you want to figure out, hey, how much, how many, like what's my percentage uh, ownership in a company, for example. That's not possible at the moment unless you store it somewhere else or, or have previous knowledge. Um, the order of the parameters uh, was recently changed. Um, we're not sure why, but uh, I'm going to talk to Alex and Fabian about it. Um, it's nitpicky things, but it's like a very small change, but it means that if we don't, um, if we don't think about it, then it means uh, future stuff won't be compatible. Then, um, which is going to be probably at next year's DevCon when uh, tokens have been flourishing, then we need to start talking about registry standards. Um, I say grown there because it's, it's, it seems like a lot more difficult problem than token standards. <laughs> um, so it's the question of should the metadata of the token be in the contract itself or should it be in a registry? Um, and it's still up to debate which one is best. We, we don't actually know um, because in certain, some circumstances you don't actually need metadata. Sometimes you want it to be in a registry, doesn't matter. Um, then the question of like the, the issue of uh, creating a loss of tokens for various use cases. Um, is it possible to make it cheap and flexible and modular enough so that you can have these kind of um, several ones but keep the nice standard set of APIs? Then I think generally, um, I think generally there's still the, the issue of it's great that we have all these standards and hopefully people use them to make everything nicely interoperable but there's still no clear way which we can think about how we potentially extend standards to the future. So hopefully the community can give some ideas about how we go forth in once the standards been defined, do we do does everyone go yay, like raise hands or, or like what does the process look like? Um, so that's something we need to consider. And the great thing is um, I think it's tomorrow. Uh, if you care about this kind of thing, uh, then uh, there's a standards panel tomorrow which we um, which we should uh, all attend so we can build many apps that interoperate. Um, I have uh, I purposely left some few minutes for uh, questions and answers. Um, so if you have any questions, please ask me. That's fun dir dirigibles, not fungibles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, um, yeah questions, yeah, they're back. So in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the token creation built into the Mist wallet. Uh, how strongly are you committed to stay compatible with, uh, with those tokens? Um, those ones are, as far as I know, I looked at the code, is it's, it, it didn't deviate at all to normal standards except the order of parameters. And we haven't deployed any tokens ourselves, so it's, it's just easy to switch to the changing of the parameters. So to answer your question, it's, that will be compatible. But those tokens don't have, as far as I know, and Alex and Fabian can correct me, but those tokens don't have approval systems in them. So you, uh, they're only, they're, they're only APIs they support is transfers at the moment. But I might be wrong, I might be wrong. Is there another question? I, we, have one more, we have time for one more question. Yeah, Jeff or someone, yeah.
Um, so you mentioned uh, the problem with storing the metadata, whether that's on the contract or in a registry. Um, would it not be possible to use IPFS? And do you see any problems with using that approach? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can use IPFS. I mean, it's not a lot of data you need to store. It's stuff, stuff like, you know, um, a name and a, maybe a symbol or and then like how many tokens are in circulation, that kind of stuff. So it's fine to store it on the blockchain. I think the, the biggest issue is actually more the naming of things. And um, we've already seen that people have created tokens that have exactly the same names as other cryptocurrencies, which is not the same thing. So, you know, I mean, that will always be the case. People will be able to do that anyway. But uh, you sort of, it would be ideal that, you know, if I create uh, Simon tokens and I decide my metadata is in, in the token itself, uh, token contract itself, and then, you know, five years from now, someone, a new registry pops up that everyone uses for token registries, and someone just steals that name, and then how does this interoperate? Like, for example, a decentralized exchange like EtherX, for example, are they going to call the information from a registry or are they going to talk to the token contract itself to, re to get that information? And it's not, it's not obvious yet what we should do. Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it.